Good morning, good morning church. It is wonderful to welcome you here, here this morning. Again, we're not in the building, but we are together as church. We are together in the name of Jesus. So I want to welcome you all watching online to our service this morning. This morning, let us just give glory to God. Let us worship his name. Let us thank Jesus for who he is and what he has done for us. I want to open this morning by reading Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to the Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sin, Lord, who would stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits for the Lord. And in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from their sins. For with the Lord there is unfailing love and there is full redemption. David wrote these words back back in Psalm, but these were words that spoke of a future, the future that when Jesus would come, he would bring the full redemption, that his death on the cross, his blood poured out for us, would bring forgiveness and salvation to us, that in his resurrected life, we too would live in resurrection. So this morning, if you've got your bread and your wine, if you're sharing communion at home with us this morning, I would ask you to reflect on those words on that truth that the Lord keeps no record of sins for those who ask for forgiveness. For those who've been asked by, of those who've been washed by the blood of Jesus, there is redemption in full and there is new life. So remember that this morning as you take the bread and wine. And this morning we have some prayer requests that I've been asked to bring to you. We pray again for Angela as she goes on with her treatment, with her chemo, with her cancer. And also we pray for Sylvia Walker. As we know, Gordon went to be with the Lord some time ago now, but unfortunately the funeral has had to be cancelled um, because Sylvia un- is unwell. So let's just pray for her this morning. Pray that the Lord will be with her, that he will be her healing. And of course we pray for Liz Goodall and we pray for Terry, Gloria's son-in-law, who is now home, which is fantastic. And for Paul, Sue's son-in-law, And of course for Barbara, who is here with us this morning, whose father also went to be with the Lord earlier this week. The Lord is faithful and he is just. And we know that for those who love him, there is hope and there is a future. And that he holds all things together in his hand. And where things in this world at the moment don't seem to make sense, we know that in him there is sense. And there is a firm foundation and an anchor for our faith. So as the word said this morning, in his word, we will put our hope. And that's where we stand this morning. So Lord, as we come into your presence this morning, we want to thank you that you are with us. And that you love us and that your love is unfailing. And that there is nowhere we can hide from your love. There is nothing we can do to be apart from your love. But your love reaches out to us. And even though we can't be together this morning, we are together by your blood. We are unified in your name, Jesus. So in unity, in togetherness, as one heart and one body, we lift you up this morning. And we worship you this morning. We proclaim you as king this morning over every situation, over every sickness, over every disease, over every street and house in this area, in our nation and this world. We declare that you are king and you are on your throne this morning. And so we join with those around the throne room of, of, of the Lord this morning and we bow down and say, holy, holy, holy is he. He who was and who is to come, Lord. Holy are you, Lord, and we raise you up in worship. We declare that we love you and we thank you that we have been forgiven, that we have been made new, that we have been redeemed by your blood. So we worship you this morning. 
Bless you, Lord. So church, even though here in the building there's only one person or two people that are allowed to sing, at home, sing your hearts out. Sing a new song to the Lord this morning. Where you are right now, stand up to your feet, raise your hands to heaven and give glory and honour to the Lord. Amen.
Yeshua, our salvation. We worship you, Lord. You are our Redeemer. You're the precious Lamb of God. Your name above all names. And one day we will stand in glory and worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, good morning and welcome to church. Uh, before I preach, uh, I have a few things to say to you. Um, it's been a 
strange set of months, hasn't it, as we've been locked down and restricted in many ways. And part of what we believe God has asked us to do in Sedgley is to reimagine what church might look like when all of this is over. We know that we're reaching hundreds, if not thousands of people by the internet. We know that God's got something bigger for us than we left. And uh, we've left, just like the children of Israel, I believe we've left Egypt under a lot of slavery, a lot of rules and regulations. We're in now in a place where God's leading us day by day. We can't do much apart from follow the cloud and the pillar of fire. But in all of that, I believe God is helping us. And as a church, we want to grow strong. We've obviously faced some hurdles with surely being promoted to glory. And part of the thing that we wanted to do as a leadership team was to remain strong and to give you some really good direction. And uh, with that in mind, we've asked someone else to join the leadership team. Uh, some of you know him really well. He's put a lot of stuff on the internet over the last six to eight months. Been prolific in his preaching and teaching for us. Um, he's jo joining our church uh, with some of the folks that are watching now. And, and we know um, that we love him already. And um, so I want to make it clear right from the start, Rich Ems is joining our leadership team. He's doing so until the Lord calls him to pioneer another church. We believe that's what God's got for him. So he's in, in for the interim, but he's in as long as God's got him here for. And we want to prepare him and we want to send him out. So it's good, isn't it, to be able to invite people on to bring some strength, but to also realise they're also on a journey. So I'm going to ask Rich to come and stand two metres away from me. And then um, the boys are going to pray for him. You won't see them. Um, they've got great faces for radio, Steve and Andy Beach. So that's, uh, that's all good. So they will pray uh, remotely and I'll pray, but we're going to ask God to bless Rich. Bob's here with us this morning as well, so if you want to come, Rich, wherever you... Oh, he's behind me already, <laughs> sneaking up. Bless the Lord. Guys, if you want to pray for Rich, let's just release him into the work here in Sedgley and all that God's got for him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I just want to thank you for Richard and for Barbara. I thank you that you've sent them to us, Lord. Mm -hmm. I thank you for the encouragement he is as a brother to me. Um, I thank you for his wisdom and his knowledge that you have bestowed upon him, uh, Father God, that he is a man who listens to your voice, uh, that does what you ask him to do, uh, that puts you first, and I thank you for that. Um, Father, as he's shared with me a story this morning, I do see a clear picture of a man, Father, that could talk through walls, that no matter what, the world builds, your word still penetrates. Mm. Your word is truth, and your word will not be denied. And I thank you, Father God, that Richard has your word in him. He has your spirit in him. He has your wisdom and direction. I see that he has your love in him, Father God, for the unsaved. And Father, I pray, I declare him as a man that tears down walls. And I pray you bring him into a new and greater season mm. of wisdom and knowledge of you, Father God. I pray for just a clear vision of where you are directing him and calling him. Father, bless him in this place, Father, that we would see walls tumble. That we would see your kingdom built and the enemy's kingdom dissipated, we pray. Bless his family, Father. And all around him, for his health, wealth and stability, I declare freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Steve, can I come and pray now? Abba Father, we just thank you. We adore you and we glorify you in your name. And Father, we thank you that... You have brought Rich and Barbara and the family to join with us for such a time as this. And Lord, I just pray in the name of our Messiah, Jesus, I pray a blessing upon their lives. I pray a blessing upon their marriage. I pray, pray a blessing upon their work. Mm -hmm. I pray a blessing upon their children, upon their family. Lord, I pray Lord, that you will be good to them. Mm -hmm. I pray, Father, that you will just touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. 
Lord, that you will enlighten them and build them and strengthen them in the grace and goodness of God. Lord, I just pray that, Lord, that everything that they bring to this leadership team will be from your throne room and from your throne room alone. Lord, that they won't come with any of their own idea, but they will listen to your Holy Spirit and they will impart what you want to speak into our team and into our church. Lord, I just bless you for them. I thank you that you have brought them into our church, into our family, into our community here. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that from this moment on, they will just knit together in our team, that we will know that you have put this as a divine appointment mm. to take us forward, as Andy said, to reclaim the enemy's territory and to proclaim the name of Jesus mm above every name. Mm -hmm. So Father, we pray in your precious name, the name of Jesus, we pray, a blessing upon them now. And Lord, be good to them, we pray. In your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, what a privilege is ours, Lord, to be here this morning and to see you still building your church. And we declare some things in faith this morning. This house will be filled. This house will see many, many young people, boys and girls, older folks as well, streaming to know you as Lord and Saviour. This house will be built because it's nothing to do with us, but it's everything to do with you. The one who declared, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not and will not prevail against it. So bless Rich and Bob today, we pray we release them into the work to which you have for them. And for all the future that you've got for them, we pray that you'd bless them indeed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're rich, you can take your seat. Let's bless the Lord. Well, we're back in faith school. If there's one thing that we need, it's to have faith in these times, faith in our God, faith in his word, and to believe that there are better days ahead of us. And right now I'm just feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit, so I'm going to take my time and liberty to just share some stuff with you this morning. My wife always tells me that I preach far too quickly. So I'm going to slow it right back because I want you to get what I'm saying to you today. We're believing for a new day in Sedgley. But it won't be because we've got good ideas. The scripture says it's the just will live by their faith. And so again we dig into the scriptures but we are now starting to see um, that God loves people who are full of faith. The scripture says that we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk in faith, not trusting what we see, but wholly trusting in what God has said and what God is doing in our lives. Which is quite difficult in the world in which we find ourselves right now when there is so much going on. As you watch Sky News or BBC or whatever you watch, you'd led to believe that things are in such a drastic way they will never be the same again. Let me tell you, there's revival on the way, the church will be back and she's coming back to get ready for the bridegroom to burst through the skies. And we are those that are going to live in these moments by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11, which we've been looking at, has been a, a whole list of God commending individuals for their walk of faith. It's almost like, you know, we've been up school uh, on many occasions, um, especially in later years, uh, where the boys have been at senior school, uh, to these reward evenings. And they've got rewards for certain things that they've done, certain things they've achieved and, and excelled in. And the head teacher or whoever it is giving out the prize claps them and they are commended for their good work. Well, in Hebrews 11, that's what God's doing. He's lifting up some individuals and he's saying, I'm really pleased about this. How they've lived their lives, how they've walked for me, how they've lived out their faith, not just a head knowledge, but actually doing it every minute of every day. And the Bible says he commends the faithful, the ones that are of, of age, the ancient ones for their faith. He never said any of them were superheroes. Because when you read that list, you will find that they were all flawed and broken just like you and me. He didn't commend them because they were so spiritual that they never sinned, that all made their mistakes. He doesn't commend them for their super living in any way shape or form but what he does say is I love their faith 
I love that they trusted me. That they gave themselves wholehearted to me without reservation. That when push came to shove, it was always me that came first and never second. The just will live by faith. So scripture here that says, do not go on passing judgment before the appointed time, but wait until the Lord comes. For he will both bring to light the secret things that are hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of the heart. Then each one will be praised when Jesus will come. You know, God is the judge of our hearts. And so very often we judge each other and our motives. Um, but this morning I want to tell you, we need to God to judge us. And we used to say, I used to say to Shirley very often, I'm running to judgment and not from judgment, that I might not be judged with the world. I want God to look after me and to, to move in my life in a powerful way. And what we see here in Hebrews 11 and verse 4 is God actually making a judgment over a sacrifice. So we pick it up if you've got your Bibles or your tablet open in Hebrews 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he testified of him who was righteous. And God testified by accepting his gift. And though he died, yet through this act of faith, he still speaks. Here's the strange thing. The first murder that we read of in the whole of history was over an offering. Strange in him. We've seen some punch uppies in churches, but I don't think I've ever seen a murder over an offering. But the first murder in the Bible was to do with an offering. You see, offerings are God's idea. God doesn't need your money, let me just tell you that. This church needs your money, so keep on giving by the grace of God. But God doesn't need your money. He's not sitting in heaven wondering when the next round of uh, offerings will be taken so the security call van with the angels can take it up to glory. Everything that has been and ever will be belongs to him. He owns everything. He is not short of resource today. So offering cannot be anything to do with God needing anything from us. Can it? Absolutely not. But you know what? It demonstrates our love and respect towards him. And actually, I hear a lot of people talk about worship. And there is some baloney talks about worship. You know what? Giving of our time and our money is just part of our worship as singing our praises to God is. You know, when we work the hours that we work at work, we're giving of our most precious thing, which is our time. The most precious thing you have is not the money in your bank, but the time that you have left in front of you. And with our time, we give to our employee and they pay us for whatever we do, whatever that is per hour or per month. And so when we give of our money here on, or in the bank towards the church and to the work of God, we're actually giving of our lives, which is our worship, isn't it? Offering ourselves as a living sacrifices, which is pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. More than singing. More than singing. And this really is a prod to those that, Give poorly and are lacklustre with your giving. You know, our God's a great giver. You know, the Bible says as little children we must imitate God. You know what it says, we all know this verse incredibly well, for God so loved the world that he gave. God's big on giving. We know he is this morning. He keeps on giving, doesn't he? He's not only have he given Jesus for our sacrifice, for our sins, but he keeps on pouring his grace upon our lives day by day. He's a great God and we serve him wholeheartedly. God so loved the world that he gave. Our giving demonstrates our loving, doesn't it? The people that we love, we want to give to. We want to put our hand in our pocket or give them of our time or give them of our finance or give them of our emotions, whatever it might be. That you know, What we demonstrate by our giving is the depth of our loving. Now, this is a hard word this morning, and some of you are not going to like me for it, but you've never, I've never held back before, so I'm not about to hold back now. Some of you need to measure the depth of your loving to this church, not to the church alone, but to God, who is the head of the church, by the, what you are giving. Not just financially, but in every way. The level of your commitment the level of your giving in terms of what you put on the plate and all the other things that God asks of us. So let me wind you back to Genesis in chapter 4 where this story begins. And let's see if we can unpack it a little bit this morning. Now the man, Adam, knew his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I've obtained a baby boy, a son, with the help of the Lord. 
And later she gave birth to Abel. Now Abel kept the flocks of sheep and goats and Cain cultivated the ground. And in the, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of fruit of the ground. But Abel brought an offering of the finest firstborn of the flocks and the fat portions. The Lord had respect and regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no respect. Now, let me unpack this a little bit for you so you understand what's going on here. Up till this point, God had not instigated an offering. When we get into uh, Deuteronomy and the story of Moses and the law, you will see that God talks about animal sacrifices and about that clearly pointed to the redemptive work of Jesus, the shadow and type. All the things that we read about in those first, chap- first chapters uh, of the Pentateuch. But here in Genesis, that is not the case. These people are not giving out of law. They are giving out of love. Can you see that? Cain and Abel weren't giving because God made them give. They were giving because they had a desire to give. And these two men gave it out, I believe, of two motivations. You can either give out of faith because you love God. Or you can feel obligated. And I'm very, very convinced that some people in church give out of obligation. God does not want you to give out of obligation this morning. He wants you to give out of love and faith towards him. It it wasn't what was given particularly. It was the heart with which it was given. Can you see that this morning? And Jesus talks to me about this little widow woman in the temple and uh, I think it's the King James Version says she has a couple of farthings that's a couple of p in uh, gornal money and she puts it in the box and Jesus said she's given more than all of these rich folks around here putting their checks in and uh, the disciples don't really understand it but Jesus said it's a heart matter she's given all that she could And there's a really big question to us this morning. Are we giving all that we could? Or are we just giving out of obligation? See, again, some people said, well, the thing thing is, God didn't like the fact that, you know, one one bought fruit and, and the other bought meat. It's got nothing to do with the fruit or the meat. Again, this is not the animal sacrifices that were instigated by Moses. This is their desire to give something back to God, the God who created them. They knew the story that Adam and Eve would have told them implicitly about the early days, about that time before the fall where they walked with God and God spoke to them in the cool of the day. And so in giving all of this stuff and information to these lads, they they need to respond to God for themselves. You know, we all have to respond to God for ourselves. Our parents can't do it for us. Adam and Eve were in no position. These boys were there to give their offering of their own free will. But Abel bought an offering of the finest, the scripture says, firstborn of his flocks and the fat portions. He gave the finest, the best, the first fruits, not second best. He was totally committed to God. Not half hearted, but giving out of a desire to bless God. If God is worth worshipping, he's worth worshipping 100%. If he's worth giving to, he's worth giving to generously. Lack of commitment in the church in this generation has been prolific and it just reflects on the half-heartedness of the people of God. But I want to challenge us in this time as God has been moving upon our hearts and we've been locked down and have to assess our motives. Will you give God 100% of all that you are? This offering was a faith transaction. What it says is, God, I will trust you with my best and I will believe that you're going to look after me. So very often we give to God last But God says, seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness and all these things that you need, I'll add to you. So very often we scratch around for £10 in our wallet rather than making a proper contribution to the house and to the work of God. And I make no uh, bones about that this morning. We need you to give to the house of God. We have got so much to do. We have plans to move forward. You know, we don't want this to be the only building that we have. We don't want this to be the only church that we plant. We want God to move among us. We want to see hundreds and thousands of people swept into the kingdom of God before Jesus comes back. And that's going to take some committed people who give by faith. Not worrying about what's going to happen next week, but believing and trusting God with their money and with their commitment to the house of the Lord. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. 
And then it says, Then Cain brought to the Lord an offering, the first fruits of the ground. He didn't say it was a good offering. He didn't say that it was special or anything else. He bought a few bananas, cucumbers, grapes, and whatever else he decided, and he brought that to God as, almost as an obligation and almost to say, that will do. That will do. Abel kept the animals, Cain farmed the ground, but the key was not what they brought, but was the heart to which they brought it with. You know what the scripture says? The Lord loves a cheerful giver. God values our faith and that we do it with joy and not grudgingly, that we give to God's work because we love him. You see, Abel saw something that Cain didn't. Abel saw giving to God as a gain and not a loss. I'm afraid for many of us as Christians, we've still not cottoned out to the fact that we don't belong to the pattern of this world or the kingdom of this world. In this world, when you give stuff away, you don't ever see it again. In the kingdom of God, when you give, it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it will be poured into your lap. The principles of the kingdom, the financial principles of the kingdom, differ from the principles of this world. Thank God we're not Tories or Labour, we're of the kingdom of God, amen. We, we belong to the God who owns all things. And can pour out of that which is not seen, everything that is seen. When he says light be, he doesn't create a few stars, he creates billions of stars. How rich is our God this morning? And he wants us to be able to walk by faith and to trust him and to believe him. He saw giving to God as a gain and not a loss. Unfortunately, his brother saw giving to God as a loss and not a gain and just bought something. God's asking more than something of us as his people this morning. The God who gave everything for us is asking for fresh commitment in our giving and commitment to him. In fact, we could retitle this message, couldn't we? Put your money where your mouth is. Or put your time where your mouth is. Or put your commitment where your mouth is. We're very good at articulating what we say is our faith. But actually faith is something that is tangible and real and has to be lived out. And we will see this as we walk into next week as we talk about Enoch. And then we talk about Noah. And then we talk about Moses. All of these people did something. You know, James says faith without reciprocated action is just dead. And we need to get on and do what God is asking us to do. I want to leave you with this scripture and this thought. Jesus taught a whole lot about money and people in church get really angry when you talk about money. But you look how many times Jesus taught about money. You know why? Because money is important. As I say, it represents the time that we give and the life that we have. So it's not just the paper notes that you keep in your wallet. Your money actually represents something. It's actually life. So as we give, we need to make sure that we give with the right heart and the right motive. But Jesus was teaching about money once when he was asked about it. And he tells this, he says this, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. And Steve Goodall is sitting here this morning and he's a tax man so he'll be really cheering me on now as I say this. Pay your taxes. Listen, if you're a born again believer, do not fiddle the inland revenue. That, my friend, is a disgrace and not something that Christians do. Fill in your tax return and be honest and put the right numbers down. Don't worry about what you don't have. Just pay your taxes to Caesar because it's important because we pay our taxes to our, our government so that we can have our roads, our schools, our fire, our ambulance, and all the rest of the other stuff that we need. So it's going to our benefit and not to our loss. So again, pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But I want to say to you as church this morning, but you need to give to God the things that are God's. Don't just flick your five pound out your pocket and put it on when you come here or pop it in the bank seriously consider how you give because how you give shows how you love some of you don't like me for that this morning and this is not an easy word to preach but I have to preach it because we've come to this point this is the whole point of being uh, taking it verse by verse you have to preach the stuff sometimes that is unpalatable and sometimes are quite hard and shakes us up but I'm asking you as a church we do give well as a church but I'm asking you to consider your own personal motivation and not just in the giving of your money but of your time and of your commitment we as a leadership team have discussed long and hard this week just around all sorts of things about how we're living out our lives now in view of the pandemic. It's been quite interesting really to understand you know, how people we thought were committed don't seem so committed anymore. 
Uh, people that we thought weren't committed seem even more committed than they've ever been. And that there are people who are disillusioned with one church and yet really kind of following others. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And listen, until all of this is over, none of us know what church will truly look like. Who knows, six months, 12 months from now, what will, will, will still be live streaming, but how many people will be in this building? How many, how many churches may have closed or new churches pioneered and opened? None of us know any of that stuff. The landscape that was has now gone. So if you're anchoring for the old days, the old days are finished. Let me just tell you that. There's a new season upon the church. But what you need to know is this. In all of that, it's down to your individual commitment. Because churches are not made up of groups of people. Primarily, they're individuals that God moulds together. And so as individually this morning, I just want to challenge you around your commitment around your giving. We want Sedgy Community Church not to have a name for itself, but to lift the name of Jesus high. That right from the beacon, right down, that the black country would know there is a church up at the top of this hill that truly believes what God says and says what God does and just gets on with the work. And so I'm challenging you. Take the moaning out of your mouth. We've looked at this, haven't we, over recent weeks. Put some God words in there. But demonstrate your faith this week in the level of your giving. The giving of your encouragement to people that's is equally as important as the money that you put into church who will you ring this week who will you encourage who will you bless you can't leave it all down to us leaders i'm working harder than i've ever worked in all of my life i don't say that for any pat on the back but that's absolutely true but you have the ability to minister to brothers and sisters and to those outside of the flock as well so i'm challenging you this week get on with the work that god is calling you to do because it's down to the motivation of your heart from the outside, it looks like God's been a bit cruel. The, the Cain brings his sacrifice and God doesn't like it. Nabal brings his sacrifice and he absolutely loves it. But the truth is God doesn't look on the outward. What does the scripture say? God looks right in on the heart. So give to Caesar what Caesar's and God's what's God's. And we're going to have a fantastic week serving the Lord together. Amen. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask Joe just to come and uh, give us a blessing and to just share some stuff that we need to do around Christmas time. So as he comes, let me pray. Father, I just pray that your word would dwell in us richly. Lord, as I teach these things, sometimes they are hard to, to, to palate and to understand. But Lord, I pray that they would drop from our head into our hearts and we will be a faith-filled, committed, radical, on-fire church for you in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. I was going to say, it's come to that time of year again, it hasn't come around quickly, but actually I feel like it's been the longest year ever, so it hasn't come around quickly, but it is that time again. We are coming up to Advent and to Christmas, and we need to think about what we're going to do for Christmas, and to be honest with you, we don't, we don't even know what the country's going to look like in a few weeks' time when we're supposed to come out of lockdown, but... In the meantime, we have a plan. And a key feature of lockdown is that households can't mix with other households. But we want to bring households together this Advent, virtually online. And so we're going to go back to the Bible and to the text, and we're going to explore the story of Christmas from the beginning, from Genesis, through the prophecies and through to the birth of Jesus. And so we want your help with that this morning. We've got a set of readings, one for every day of Advent, and we want households to come together and to put this together and do these readings. So as a family, as households, we're going to share the story of Christmas, the story of Jesus' coming together. And so for each day, we'd like a different household to do a different reading. Now, for some of you, you may be really keen to do that, and you've got the technology at home to do that, so to be able to film a video, you can put on Facebook. For others, you might not feel so keen, um, or you may not have the technology, but we'd really encourage you to be part of this. And so we can do other things. We can, we can just phone you up, and we can record you um, audibly. We can just record the sound of you telling the story of Christmas. And so it'd be great that come Christmas Day online, we have told the story of Christmas together and gone through that Advent journey. And so if you're interested in helping us out with this, drop us a message on Facebook, get in touch with us, give us a call. But if you don't, expect a call from me or from Steve or somebody, because we'll be calling around asking for your help. And so we will get back to you um, in the coming weeks when we know what Christmas is going to look like here. But of course, none of us know where we're going to be in a few weeks' time.
But this morning, church, I want to leave you with a blessing from the Lord. Lord, I want to thank you that you have been with us this morning, that you have been present with us wherever we are. And so now, as we go and we carry on with our days and our weeks, I pray that we would know your presence with us, because you never leave us. And I pray that as we go about our business, we will be challenged by the words that we have heard this morning, that you would remind us of the words that we have heard this morning. But as we go, Lord, I pray that you would give us your blessing, that you would make your face to shine upon us, and we would see you in all that we face and all that we do. And so, Lord, as we go this morning, we declare that you are good, and we give you all the glory and the honour that is due to your name. Amen.